where, as you can see, the Eiffel Tower behind me in somewhat celebratory form. There is tonight, how can one put it, at least a chance to hope. It was, of course, five years ago, six years ago now, that they signed the Paris Agreement. Now everything leads to this crucial climate conference coming three weeks' time in Glasgow. And in the momentum that is building to that, there is a genuine chance for some optimism tonight. This is a huge breakthrough. Cutting and slashing emissions of methane is the quickest way to get our out-of-control climate back into control. You've got, as you say, John, 24 countries signed up, nine of the 20th biggest emitters already in there. As we move now to Glasgow, the pressure on the Chinese, the on the Indians, on the Indonesians, on the uh, Australians, on these big polluting countries is going to be enormous. Uh, and not just diplomatically, there's another $200 million chucked in today by the likes of Bill Great and, and Michael Bloomberg, by the world's philanthropists. There is definitely an extraordinary sense of momentum building on that front, on the methane front and some others. But let's have a look at what the methane uh, moves mean as we are three weeks out from Glasgow. Methane's an across-the-board pollutant. Landfill sites, a key source of it. Another big emitter, intensive agriculture, particularly beef and dairy production. But oil and gas extraction are also high emitters, and all of these will now be specifically targeted with new laws, designed to turn what at the moment is just promise and rhetoric into genuine action. Methane is far more damaging than carbon dioxide, though it remains in our atmosphere for a much shorter time. So damaging that half the one degree Celsius rise in global temperatures since pre-industrial times has come from this gas. We're, uh, we're Back on September the 17th, the US, EU and seven other countries announced the breakthrough deal. To reduce global methane emissions by at least 30 percent below 2020 levels, by 2030. This will not only rapidly reduce the rate of global warming, but it will, re it will also produce uh, a very valuable side benefit, like improving public health and agricultural output. The UK joins soon after, and today's sign up from 24 more, including France and Germany, boosts that enormously. If other big emitters now join the pledge in Glasgow at the climate conference, it could turn our current course of 45% increase in greenhouse gas emission to a negative 0.6 degree fall, a huge change in direction. Well, yes, so watch the choreography and the diplomacy from here on in these next crucial three weeks as we build towards events in Glasgow. And clearly they're saying today that the actual formal announcement of this global methane pledge happens at Glasgow. What they mean is we want to get as many people on board as possible, of course, China, um, in the meantime, to make that announce announcement even more significant uh, come the COP26 in Glasgow than it already is. Word or two about money tonight. The other big theme of that conference, of course, is cutting emissions, but it's also providing the money necessary. $100 billion to decarbonisation and demethanization, if that's the word going, amongst emerging economies who need it most, some of them far more directly threatened at the moment by the climate crisis than we are perhaps in the rich West. Well, a uh, crucial meeting of finance, uh, finance ministers going on right now uh, in Washington through this week till Sunday. So look at that for more developments on the money front. The Americans have already put up their cash. They've stumped up. There are signs on movement uh, there as well. What you can say, even at this stage, that compared to recent COP conference of parties, they happen every year on climate, remember, compared to the recent ones in, in Madrid and Poland, we have an extraordinary sense of momentum already building up to us that is getting more and more to where we need to be. There is a colossal amount of work to do, of course, down the line, both in these next crucial three weeks and those vital two weeks on Clyde's side. Back to you. Alex Thompson in Paris. And I do apologise for the interruptions in his transmission. I'd like to blame Ethan, but I think it's probably not that. And it's not just climate commitments being made today. The world has also come together virtually for the start of COP15, a key UN conference delayed twice by COVID with the task of reversing biodiversity loss. Now, the United Kingdom is already one of the world's most nature-depleted nations. And today, business leaders have written an open letter urging government to take meaningful action on mass extinctions or risk a dead planet. Tonight, 
we show what that planet looks like through the lens of the Natural History Museum's Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. The images tell the story of nature in a ghastly crisis. As the world comes together to meet virtually today, the stakes could not be higher. The last global biodiversity target set in 2010 were missed by every country by the deadline last year. In what's been called the lost decade, more of life on Earth has been pushed to the very edge of existence. Tonight, with exclusive access to the Wildlife Photographer of the Year contest, we show the impacts of the unfolding climate and ecological crisis in which we live. In the last couple of years, what we're seeing is that more and more we're receiving documentary images that really look at climate change and the environmental threat that the planet is facing. We can see the beauty and the drama, but we also see the threats and the human impact that we're having on the planet. And so for the 57th edition of the competition, uh, I've decided to uh, bring two new categories uh, connected with climate change. These wildlife photographers, I consider them warriors. They're out there in the field documenting really vital stories that the world needs to see. In Australia, unusually extreme heat is leading to mass mortality events. The image I capture shows grey-headed flying foxes in a behaviour called clumping and this happens when they get really, really hot and they try and move away from the heat and they get behind a tree. But the problem with this is it creates a negative feedback loop and they get hotter and hotter and eventually one will fall and knock the rest to the ground and so they'll be lying on the ground dying from heat stress. And grey-headed flying foxes are vital keystone species. They help uh, disperse seeds and pollen for about a hundred plants across Australia up and down the east coast. If they became extinct we would start losing parts of our forests and from that other species. For example koalas. In Kenya floods in what should be the dry season are threatening not only human populations but wildlife too. I don't remember actually clicking Obviously, I did take the photographs, but I don't remember it. All I do remember is shouting, oh my God, they're going to drown, they're going to drown. The village elders had actually never seen such a bad flooding in their lifetime. It's usually nice and dry during that time of the year, but it had been raining nonstop for four to five months. When they finally did make land, it was this joyous moment, and we just couldn't believe what we had witnessed. Uh, we were hugging each other, we had tears of joy, and it was just an unbelievable moment. And it's not just in tropical countries that wildlife is struggling. It's happening here in the United Kingdom too. When I came across this seal, I did want to take obviously the photograph of it, but my primary concern was its welfare because it was obviously in a great deal of distress and a great deal of pain. We managed to contact the relevant people who came out and rescued it, but it, it, it really saddened me to think how many other seals that we don't come across. While filming Mick, we saw for ourselves a seal with fishing wire wound tightly around its neck and had to call the same rescuers who had saved the seal in Mick's photo. And we seem to think that when we, you know, we watch TV and we see things in far off places and we seem to assume that these things happen in other countries but actually it's happening right here and it's right on our doorstep. It certainly gives us something to think about when we think about you know, the, the damage that humanity's doing to the planet and the impact it's having on the, the wildlife. Around the world, teenage photographers are concerned about what's happening in wildlife on their doorstep too. L'Apollon, c'est vraiment mon papillon préféré. Uh, J'ai découvert pour la première fois il y a trois ans dans les Alpes. C'est un papillon qui est très présent là-bas, mais malheureusement, chez moi, il est en voie de disparition à cause du réchauffement climatique. Nous, aujourd'hui, on est la première génération à vraiment avoir à subir les conséquences du réchauffement climatique. Et j'aimerais tellement que les gens se, se mobilisent pour, pour changer les choses, vu l'urgence de la situation. Scientists record climate change by tracking butterfly movements. As temperatures increase, mountain-dwelling butterflies are being forced to higher and higher altitudes in search of cooler environments. Soon, they'll have nowhere to go. So this is the Apollo butterfly, like the one featured on the exhibition photo. Butterflies and moths are the food for many, many organisms, including birds, spiders, lizards. So if they're not in the planet, we will probably lose the next level of the food chain of these big animals also, they will be suffering too. 
Museum researchers are gathering data on how biodiversity is responding to human activity. As we transform our landscapes, we're essentially suffocating biodiversity. When we remove habitats that the creatures around us rely on, they lose resources. And so species have to live in a much smaller area or they have to adapt to survive in the human dominated spaces. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, primate populations are being destroyed due to human activity. Firstly, habitat destruction, and then by being hunted. As for many, bushmeat is the principal source of affordable protein. For the last nearly two years now, we're living through COVID. COVID is a zoonotic disease. It came because humans consume animals they shouldn't be consuming. So not only are we losing these animals and their habitats, but we're also threatening ourselves through not paying attention to this issue. So my story uh, is about the Wiro chimp and Z sanctuary. So those chimps come from the illegal bushmeat trade. And these little chimps climb into your lap and take your hand, just like a human baby would. That's quite moving, you know. Um, it definitely reinforces your sense of purpose in doing this kind of work. We want to create impact and action. Every person that connects with these images, we really want them to th rethink their individual behaviours. And I really hope that people look at these images and take a stance. If an image doesn't get people to start doing something or stop doing something or change what they're doing, it's a little bit of a wasted opportunity. So a lot of my work now is very much driven around trying to take an image that will drive behaviour because for me, that's the power of great imagery.